Welcome to everyone to what is an extremely important topic, education in Australia, the struggle for greater equality. And this is something that's very dear to all of our hearts because we are all in some way um, touched by education. And uh, as I always tell my teacher education students, as a teacher or as an educator, we hold in our hands a very powerful social engineering tool called the curriculum. And I think it's very important for us to continuously look at these questions of how equality is being either entrenched further or redressed through what we do in education. And it's wonderful to have three such important speakers on this topic today. And I'm going to introduce firstly Professor Carmen Lawrence and Carmen is uh, retired from politics in 2007. She's currently the Winthrop Professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Western Australia and she is also the Chair of the Australian Heritage Council. She was also a member of the Gonski Review Panel which was, and she will tell you the process of that, of that review, <clears throat> which was the first major review of its kind in 40 years into schooling and funding for schooling. And in introducing the review, the report which has just come out, the chair, or which came out some little time ago, David Gonski said, the panel is strongly of the view that the proposed funding arrangements outlined in the report are required to drive improved outcomes for all Australian students and to ensure that differences in educational outcomes are not the result of differences in wealth, income, power or possessions. So first of all, we're very pleased that Dr Lawrence has been able to join us today and welcome. What I wanted to do today was to put the, the Gonski report in context um, not only the context of the educational outcomes that were the focus of the report, but also the broader uh, social context. And there are just a couple of things that I think are worth uh, reflecting on, and others have done it better than I. C. Wright Mills, for instance, in his uh, The Power Elite, said the following, and I think this is part of the problem with the debate in Australia. He said, people with advantages are loath to believe that they just happen to be people with advantages they come readily to define themselves as inherently worthy of what they possess. They come to believe themselves naturally elite. And I think that's one of the sentiments that underpins some of the discussion about funding in Australia and inequality as well. And again, an outsider's perspective in a sense on the generic problem of what happens when there are inequalities in educational outcomes that are not the result of, if you like, inherent ability but of the structure of social arrangements. James Galbraith, who's done a lot of work on inequality globally, son of John Kenneth, um, said the following, countries with highly unequal wealth are like fields of unequally watered wheat. Some areas of the field grow to their potential, some don't. And the point that he makes strongly, I think, um, and one that I would want to make too, and that's bad for the entire field's productivity. Um, one of the things that we haven't wanted to talk about in Australia for a long time is inequality. I'm going to put this thing aside now. I just needed that quote. Um, is, is inequality. I started, I guess, asking questions about inequality more than a decade or so ago. I wasn't alone in that. But it was very hard to get anyone interested because they would say things like, look, overall the level of wealth in Australia has improved and that includes the least well off. Unlike the United States where in fact the lower income uh, groups, the bottom 20% have gone backwards, in Australia that's not true. There's been a steady increase for all quintiles or whatever separation you want to make in the total distribution of income, uh, less so of wealth. There's been higher concentrations of wealth. But over time we've seen a growing gap between whether you take the, the top 1% and the rest or the top 10% and the rest um, and a hollowing out to some extent of the middle, although that's less evident in Australia than it is in some of our companion Anglophone countries like the UK and the US. But that growing inequality is a fact of life um, and people are aware of it, but not as aware as you might think. 
Uh, Dan Ariely and Norton actually did some work in the US on uh, income distributions and found that people who in the United States had a, an idea about the distribution of wealth that was way, um, it was distorted in comparison to the reality. What they said they'd prefer, and so there's been some criticism of this, was a distribution of wealth that looked more like the Scandinavian countries. Uh, what they estimated to be the case was that it was more equal than it actually was. And when, they, when Ariely and Norton came to Australia and did similar work, they found similar results. That when you present people with the question, what sort of distribution of wealth would you like? They, they actually uh, answer in ways that suggest they'd like a distribution that's roughly equal, not quite, but roughly equal between all the, the components of society. Their estimate of the level of inequality is also lower than the reality. But nonetheless, they do understand that there is inequality in our society. And we know there's a whole lot of work now that looks at the relationship between inequality within and between countries and a whole lot of social outcomes. So the absolute level of wealth is not as important as the unequal distribution of wealth in wealthy countries like ours uh, in terms of predicting school outcomes, for example, educational performance, health, um, including life expectancy, um, a whole range of social ills aggregate where you have great inequality. And I suppose the, the exemplar that you can look to uh, where that's been taken to an extreme to some extent is the United States. And there have been significant trends over time both in growing inequality and widening uh, social ills. So that's the context in which I place this. And it's interesting that the work, and, and there's a lot of it now, it's not just down to the Wilkinson and Pickett spirit level book that some of you may be familiar with, that, that shows that there are strong associations between inequality and the willingness of societies to invest in social goods, whether it's education or health or public housing or conservation. We don't know the precise mechanisms that mediate the relationship between inequality and these social ills, but it's likely to include investment in education in particular. And that's what I really want to talk about uh, today. Um, just a very quick snapshot of what the Gonski panel found in looking at education in Australia. And we relied upon some very significant original research that was undertaken uh, by a range mainly of academics but some consulting firms, assembling the data, both the Australian data that we had and as well as comparisons uh, with the international field. One of the things that we didn't need to be told but is very evident is that there has been a drift in Australia toward a greater private provision of education away from the government sector, particularly at secondary level, and therefore greater segregation. Uh, and it is greater segregation by income, parental status and wealth. And it was very clear when we looked at the contemporary picture that despite the fact that I suppose the story has been that the Catholic system fairly closely resembled the the government system in terms of the distribution of people with uh, disadvantages, whether in, uh, because of their indigenous status or their disability or their low socioeconomic status. It was very clear, in fact, that there was a hierarchy which went independent Catholic government. Government schools had a much higher proportion of every form of disadvantaged student uh, in their mix. And that's led a lot of people to describe the public system as, as being residualised, that that the complex, difficult cases now reside principally uh, in government schools. And I think a more important point to make in a way is that they reside in some government schools, that the proportion of schools who have a high concentration of kids with various disadvantages, often compound disadvantages, uh, is significant um, and that those schools are the ones with the really difficult uh, education tasks. I think it's fair to place this in the context of Australia's performance, which has generally been very high insofar as we can measure it. And I, I hasten to add, and we did too, that um, the measures that you have of literacy, numeracy and science capacity, the international and national data, are limited. Um, they don't give you an entire snapshot of what schools do and how they do it. We were very well aware of that. It particularly doesn't c capture social benefits um, that accrue uh, in education, the wider creative capacity of students, um, their citizenship, if you like. All of those things are not picked up by those data. So with that qualification, Australia stood and has stood um, pretty high in international rankings. And in some ways, you, know, you might ask, does it matter where we stand in international rankings? 
and that's a question I'll sort of leave open, but I think generally speaking governments in particular and probably uh, school administrators and parents would be keen to know uh, where we stand. And the particular piece of relevant data is that we've been declining in relative terms, partly because some societies, some countries have got better in their performance on these tests, particularly our Southeast Asian neighbours, places like South Korea, Hong Kong and so on. But I, I guess the more concerning question uh, for me is the fact that we seem to be dipping in absolute terms. So the proportion of our students who are not reaching the benchmarks uh, up to level two, which are considered what you need in order to graduate from school with adequate skills, that's increasing slightly and the NAPLAN results show some similar trends. And the proportion of students in the highest achieving group has also apparently declined. Now, trends are notoriously difficult um, and it may be that some of these data uh, don't stand the test of time. But nonetheless, there does seem to be a suggestion of declining overall performance, both in relative and absolute terms. The more significant problem and the one um, that the panel was really uh, tasked to address was the question of the long tail, the big gap in performance between um, the highest and lowest performing students. Uh, you would expect and I think judge that you know, there is a reasonable, reasonably normal distribution of ability by socioeconomic status, etc. Um, and in societies that have good educational outcomes, reasonably narrow uh, inequality in, in broad terms and, and reasonably narrow inequality in educational terms, uh, they do better overall uh, in terms of outcomes for students. Our long tail, um, and it is getting wider from all um, the data that we've seen, suggests that your socioeconomic status is a much stronger predictor of your performance here than it would be, say, if you lived in Finland or South Korea or Japan. And there's no obvious reason why that should be so except that the, the system uh, overall is, if you like, supporting um, poorer educational outcomes. Now the temptation I think is always to point to the schools and say that's because of the school system, in particular the government school system. But I think what we found and saw very clearly was that really it was about the concentration of disadvantage and the failure to apply resources appropriately on the basis of the, the educational task. What's happened in Australia is a greater segregation of students by, um, as I say, uh, socioeconomic background, income, parental status and so on, with so-called middle class flight um, and, the, and the segregation of schools. So we thought it was our task to identify precisely what those variables were uh, that were leading to this a longer tail and to try, because our task was funding, and to try and recommend ways uh, that they might be overcome. I hasten to add that some of the best performing systems actually spend less money than some of the worst performing systems. So it's not necessarily about the quantum, although we did recommend an increase in funding. It's really about where the money goes. And what we found was that the money is not going where it's most needed. I'm trying to unpick what the states were doing uh, in relation to funding educational disadvantage in their domains, whether by socioeconomic status or disability or indigenous status or remoteness, these were the key uh, indicators that we looked at was extremely difficult. And I think it has to be said, uh, if you honestly appraise the results of the, uh, our inquiry, that you can't say what they were doing with the money. And they can't say in many cases what they were doing with the money that they were getting. And um, in many cases, they don't want anyone else to know because it's such a messy, patchy picture. So part of what we were saying is, look, this should be absolutely transparent. You have a, a basic al um, allocation per student, regardless of the system uh, uh, where they're being educated, and then you have various loadings for the specific individual disadvantages that we know attach to, for instance, uh, low levels of parental education, um, being an Indigenous student in a remote area and so on, that there would be a personal, if you like, loading for that. But we were also very clear that there should be additional uh, loadings for the concentration of disadvantage that w we had observed. So there would be further resources applied to those schools who had high proportions of Aboriginal students or high proportions of kids from low socioeconomic backgrounds. And I think ideally if you're redesigning the system from the start, and I'm probably getting close to my time, you would you would uh, have something like the, Swedish, uh, the, the Finnish system, or the Swedes for that matter, with a single unitary funding source. We're not going to be there. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to patch up the, the gaps that have emerged 
over the long period that, that the system has been in existence with the funding responsibilities separated as they are between the Commonwealth and the states. But our model, in a sense, tries to be blind to the particular type of school, except that we also say that where parents are making a choice to send their children to an independent school, um, that they, their capacity to pay should be a relevant consideration. So we try to mix in the needs of the students, the capacity of the parents, with a long-term desire to see greater integration in the system, ultimately. Because one of the reasons that particularly middle-class parents take their kids out of government schools is they perceive that they're, they're failing, uh, that their children are likely to do less well, and so they move them on. And what you have is what Chu calls um, a privileged student bias start to emerge. The OECD and now a range of uh, studies uh, from other sources looking at the variety of countries show very clearly that where you have high levels of segregation, particularly segregation by wealth, power, status, etc., uh, and high concentrations of disadvantage, the overall level of performance drops. It's not just the kids who are in those less satisfactory circumstances who are missing out, it's everybody. So the privileged student bias, as Chu calls it, actually leads to more resources being pulled into parts of the system where it's really not needed. And some of the arguments, for instance, about class size, uh, teacher-student ratios, I think have been completely um, uh, blindsided by the failure to distinguish between the, the marginal benefit. Ironically, the increased uh, fees in a lot of private schools that we've seen have been used to purchase smaller class sizes and, and better teacher-student ratios, where the marginal benefit of that dollar invested is very small in terms of educational outcomes. And the evidence shows, I think, pretty clearly that if you invest the same dollar to reduce class sizes and improve teacher-student ratios in a low-performing, low-resource school, you get a big bang for your buck. So I think we have to unpick some of those debates uh, more precisely. We didn't say where we thought the money should go, uh, but obviously improving the capacity of teachers, um, not teacher bashing, but just, for instance, giving them more time out of the classroom, uh, uh, higher levels of valuation of, or valuing of teaching. These are all important things. The curriculum is obviously critical. Ironically, and I'll just make this my final point, the centralisation of funding we thought would be a desirable outcome, not necessarily in the hands of the Commonwealth, but you know, a, a single system of funding, uh, although we in the end recognise the, the federation and all its weaknesses, was desirable. But in every other element of education, devolving responsibility as close as possible to the classroom makes most sense. So, for instance, national curriculum, uh, this is my personal view, not the panels, uh, is going in exactly the wrong direction. And some of the research suggests that placing in the hands of the teacher the responsibility for curriculum and pedagogy and in the hands of the principal the distribution of resources within the school is likely to achieve a far better outcome than a top-down system. Uh, and unfortunately, in all of those elements, we're moving in exactly the opposite direction to the, the suggestions that come from uh, international uh, data analysis. I'm going to leave it there. I know there are lots of questions that you might like to ask, but I'm sure we'll get to those in the panel. Thank you very much indeed, Carmen. And there will be many questions. I think that really stimulates lots of questions. Um, I'd like to introduce now Professor Richard Teese, um, who is Director of the Centre for Research on Educational Systems at the, the University of Melbourne um, and he's a professor of post-compulsory education and training there um, and is really interested in, in uh, specialist school systems or in school systems particularly, how well they work for whom and how they might be improved. So that he's really on his home turf here. He's also a distinguished visiting professor at La Trobe University so we're very pleased to have you in both capacities. Richard, thank you. I would also like to focus on the question of context for Gonski because I, I think um, what um, Carmen has said is extremely instructive um, and, and I'm not sure that I can add a great deal to it but the historical context is really important and I think we need to reflect on, on uh, the key trends that describe the history uh, of our school system in the last 50 years. I've only got a quarter of an hour, so this is going to be quite a challenge. But it's really important to do this because there are these two huge trends at work in the growth of our school system which underpin the tensions in funding and that we really need to understand those, those trends quite well. And the, the first one is what 
could be described as a demand for access. And this arises from poorer families, working class, lower middle class families, over the period of those 50 to 60 years have been exposed to, to very strong economic pressures, particularly after the first oil shock in December 73, when unemployment rose very dramatically. So what we've seen since that time is a growing economic dependence on completing school and being successful at school. So that's, that's one trend, which is really very important, which I call the access trend. The other trend, though, which is in a kind of contrapuntal relationship to the first one, is the advantage trend. It's the demand for advantage through education. And it's manifest in the demand for selective schooling, including within the government sector, not simply in the non-government sector. So we've had two, two of these trends um, competing with each other over the 50 to 60 year period. And uh, in a way, Gonski was asked to harmonise these trends, although the report doesn't talk about those trends, but it picks up on the key themes. Governments over that period of time have responded to both these trends in demand for education and have actually encouraged uh, the trends, uh, even though these are not convergent trends, they're in competition with each other. And, uh, and I'll come back to that point a bit later. I would say the advantage trend over this long period of time, half a century, has won out convincingly. And we can see that by looking at the nature of the, the educational advantage that has been achieved by high income, high SES families over that period of time. Their children are two years in front of children from low SES families at year three. And that two-year advantage actually increases over stages of schooling to the final um, year nine testing. Um, they, their children will complete school more often. They will take more demanding subjects in the curriculum of senior high school. They will do exceptionally well in those subjects. Um, they, will, they have two and a half times the chance of being represented in the ranks of university students and five times the chance of low SES students being represented in the group of eight universities. The advantages are huge and we could conclude that what people from high SES backgrounds have achieved over this long period of time is not only an expansion in opportunity, and that's, that's extremely important in itself, but an expansion of outcome. They've converted opportunity into outcome. And failure in the sector uh, of selective schooling, which is not only uh, private, is now pr practically extinct. There is almost no failure in high SES schools. It's been abolished or, as I've said in a, in a, in a book, ex exported. The situation for um, children attending schools in uh, low SES communities is completely different. The outcomes that they have are much weaker. Um, as I've indicated, they're two years behind for a start. They never make up the gap. On average, clearly individuals do, but they, as a group, they never make up the gap. The children from these backgrounds drop out much more often. They have much more impaired access to high cognitive demand subjects in the curriculum. Uh, for example, in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, the chances of your studying economics, geography, history, languages in the government high school are about one in four. That is to have the subject on the, on the menu, let alone at, at, uh, enrol in it. So the, the access is very much weaker. The, the uh, the marks that children from low SES backgrounds get when they do attempt reasonably demanding subjects are much, much weaker. Uh, high SES students attempting mathematical methods, literature, uh, will receive up, up to, in every second case, a, um, a B plus A or an A plus. It, almost every second student is getting that kind of result, which is just terrific for those kids but it comes at the price of competitive exclusion of other kids. The chances of a, 
of a student from a lower working class family in the northern suburbs of Melbourne attending a government school and failing the least demanding maths subject in the VCE uh, is one in two. 50% failure rate, which is the equivalent of the failure rate in pure mathematics in 1950. So these gaps are enormous and what we see in the, in the public system is that we're still working on an opportunities logic, not an outcomes logic. That is, we've said, here, there, here is a chance for you, but that's all it is. It's not an outcome for you. It's not the extinction of failure. It is not the guarantee of globally high success rates. It's a chance. And, and we can't control the chance. But if we were in the selective sector of schooling, the attitude is completely different uh, because there's global success. There's almost uh, a monopoly of success, to, take, uh, to use extreme language. And we, we capture that, uh, sadly, perhaps, in the behaviour recently of a parent of a student, I think at Geelong Grammar or Geelong College, who is suing the school for screwing up. And, and how, how can you have this concept that you, the school, screwed up? Where does that come from? It's intriguing and it suggests the whole way in which that sector works to guarantee the outcome, not simply to provide the opportunity along with a weak chance of success. So here is a, a, a frustrated mother taking action against a school that has defaulted on its implicit uh, claim and promise that there is no failure in this institution. And we're not talking about national minimum standards here. We're talking about kicking down the door to medical school or law school. So it's quite, to me, very striking that we've had these two logics, these two demands over all this period of time where we've said uh, we've seen the poorest families become more and more economically dependent on finishing school, on doing well, on going to TAFE or going to university. They have to do it because the jobs have gone. Uh, Two-thirds of all full-time jobs for boys have disappeared in this country since uh, the late 1970s and half of all full-time jobs for girls, they're gone. People from these backgrounds have to use school and they have to use it well. But against this is a trend which says you are not crowding us out. We insist on a competitive advantage. And the competitive advantage is we do the high stakes subjects and we get the high marks in the high stakes subjects and we don't go to any garbage university. We go to good universities, as distinct from the ones created in the wake of the massification of the secondary school system. And, and to me, to my way of thinking, uh, the advantage trend has won out because it's, it's loaded, it's charged politically like an, a, a molecule with an electrical charge. This one's a political charge and it's enormously powerful. So... Uh, that's the basic dilemma for Gonski was how do we harmonise how do we harmonise these two trends we can't say no to the legitimate aspirations of people from poorer backgrounds to enable their children to finish school and do well, we can't say no it's not in our economic interest and it's inequitable but how do you say no to parents who buy success? How do you say no to them? Gonski struggles with this and uses the concept, and I don't, I don't mean any disrespect <laughs> uh, at all because I, 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 I think the whole process we've been through has been really interesting, but Gonski tries to deal with this with the concept of partnership which is a concept borrowed from the Christian schools lobby and their submissions and it's that language of we're all in this together. But sadly we're not. We're not all in this together. Uh, I wish we were. What we've done, we've got the money. 
we have got the money to close the achievement gaps. We can compress these achievement gaps so that ch children from poor backgrounds are not two years behind, so that they are able to tackle difficult subjects and do well. We can close the gap. We're a rich country. But instead of applying our resources to closing that gap, we have used it to expand the gap through funding of choice policies. So we've actually enlarged the gap. So we would drain the resources away from the priority area which, which was no child should fail. We drained the resources away, poured them into choice, which has expanded the gap, worsened it. As Carmen has pointed out, we have a, one of the most segregated, socially segregated systems in the OECD, about 58% of children from the most disadvantaged families attend schools which are predominantly disadvantaged. They're ghettos. Within a kilometre or so of this very campus we can see the residualisation at work. Our funding models across the eight systems, and, and I work on funding models for my living, are inequitable and insensitive. They're antique. They're worthless in terms of tackling the major challenges which, which are the achievement gap. So I come away thinking it's great that we had Gonski. It is our big chance. We've got to keep the key issues on the agenda uh, even though it's very depressing, the snail-like pace of change. But perhaps even more importantly, it is to set priorities and to have the priorities really clearly in front of us. The priority cannot be to fund choice at the expense of quality in our public school system. And that's what we've been doing, um, for especially since the 1980s. And I, I think I'm well over my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And again, we'll have a chance to ask some questions of the panel after we've heard from Dennis. So I'll introduce Professor Dennis Altman, who is Director of the Institute for Human Security at La Trobe University within the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. So, Dennis, thank you. My, my great regret is that, uh, unfortunately, the person from the independent schools isn't here because I was going to begin, I am going to begin, uh, by sharing with you the fact that I went to a private school um, in Hobart and when I got to university I discovered that in fact the kids who'd come from Hobart High, uh, one of my colleagues actually went to Hobart High, the kids who came from Hobart High were smarter, more fun, more interesting and I really resented the fact that my parents had wasted all that money. And I really would like to have been able to say this <laughs> to these people for whom I really cannot have much respect. I mean, I'm quite serious. I think that, and I, I think that you have a problem with this panel. Let's be honest. You have a group of well-meaning, ageing social democrats. We all would like to see a much more egalitarian and equal society. And what I really want to raise is some rather difficult questions, I think, which is why is it so difficult to make that argument. I mean, I sit here and I'm totally convinced, and I suspect almost everyone in this room is totally convinced when we hear Carmen and Richard. But at the same time, I think if I look at the political landscape, I doubt that it is going to be the attitude that is going to predominate in Australia in the next decade. And indeed, in preparation for this uh, panel, I read uh, a recent press conference involving the Leader of the Opposition and uh, Christopher Pine, who's Shadow Minister for Education, in which they basically dismiss a great deal already of what Gonski is recommending. And it seems to me that the great problem we have is we cannot assume any longer that, it's, that most Australians believe inequality. Certainly if you ask people they're not going to say to you we're committed to inequality but I think something fundamentally has happened in our political culture 
that has been growing probably since the 1980s and in a way I think I'm saying something very similar to Richard but I'm using a somewhat different language and I'm, and I'm using the language of equality versus aspirational. Now, Robert and I were talking about this before. My sense is that aspirational came into mainstream political language via Mark Latham, but we're not sure, and Carmen, you may well know whether it was being used a lot before then. Um, and I think that when Latham talked about aspirational, he did not actually intend it to mean what it has come to mean. Because I think what it has come to mean is code for individuals getting ahead without any concern for larger social goods or larger social cohesion. And the example I would give of why I believe this has become such an important motif of Australian contemporary political culture is the extraordinary inability of the current government to persuade the great majority of Australians that a mining tax is unfair, uh, sorry, that a mining tax is fair, and the extraordinary spectacle of Gina Reinhart and Clive Palmer, who are surely two of the least attractive representatives of gouger capitalism that have ever been produced, they somehow seem to have more popular support than a government that is talking about redistribution of resources. Now, in a country in which that is happening, I think we have to think very hard and seriously. Does that mean that what we all like to think is part of Australian political culture, commitment to fairness, commitment to equality, commitment to a fair go, actually means anything? And my hunch is that it doesn't, and that explains precisely the points that Richard was making. It explains why our politicians um, will continue to tolerate a system which is perpetuating and indeed increasing inequality and why the interesting and I would say mild reforms of Gonski and Carmen and I can, can discuss this later um, will on the whole not be taken up. And I should say, I say mild reforms because I again in my you know, short preparation uh, for today tried to find out, it's actually quite difficult to find out how Australia ranks comparatively with other rich countries in terms of the division between private and public schooling. And certainly, I mean, it's complicated because there are some European countries in which the tradition of education is very much bound up with essentially state-funded but religiously run uh, schools. And so if you take Belgium or the Netherlands, you come up with rather what would look to us strange figures. But if you take comparable English-speaking wealthy countries, Australia has a far higher percentage of kids going to private schools with all the unfortunate consequences that Richard pointed to, but I think a further one that we have to have a serious debate about, which is social cohesion. I find it very troubling that we encourage, we don't just accept, we encourage people with fundamentalist religious beliefs to establish schools and send their kids to them. I find it very troubling that in addition to class segregation we also have religious and I think increasingly ethnic segregation in our school system. And again, I think it is going, that is a debate we, we don't even have. I mean, I understand all the political realities why the Gonski Review did what it did. And I think, you know, where I, had I been a member with you, Carmen, I probably would also have said, OK, we cannot go back. We can't have dogs, um, which probably you and I remember dogs. Most of you in the audience were not born at the time of dogs, which was a short-lived movement in the 60s to defend government schools when the Commonwealth started providing funding uh, for religious-based schools. But I think that there are some very big issues that the review raises, and I think, and I th you know, I think this whole debate about are we genuinely committed to a more egalitarian society is an absolutely crucial one that we have to ask of all our political leaders. I really wish I could say, you know, I, of course, the Labour Party stands for this. I'm no longer able, I think, to say that with great conviction. But I do want to 
take the discussion just slightly into the realm of higher education for two reasons. One is that in Victoria at the moment we are seeing, I think, a very, very frightening move by the state government to undermine the TAFE system, in effect to privatise the TAFE system. Uh, and you will all be familiar with, with, with stories like the end of the Auslan uh, program in the TAFE system in Victoria, with the fact that a number of TAFEs are embarking, will have to embark on major retrenchments of staff. The consequences of that for a lot of people who use the TAFEs to move on to universities and the economic consequences of that, not so much for our university but certainly and clearly at the moment for VU and for Ballarat and probably for other universities, are enormous. And I mean, I think that, uh, you know, What's the point of counting Ted Bailey's broken promises? For some reason, nobody cares if Ted Bailey breaks a promise. If Julia Gillard changes her mind about the weather, it's a whole week of front-page headlines. And I don't quite understand why Bailey gets away with this, but the systematic destruction of the TAFE system is, I think, directly related to any concern we have for education. And can I finally say something about us at this university? And Richard, with all due respect, can I say it is really unfortunate to perpetuate the idea that somehow, implicitly, it's better to go to a G8 university. It isn't. And we're not a G8 university and there are many areas in which we offer better teaching and have better researchers than many of the G8 universities. A friend of mine has just finished a PhD, indeed at your university, Richard, which usually comes out number one in the Australian rankings. And he has said to me, I wish I'd come to La Trobe because I would have got better supervision. And I think that the reason I raise this is that running through our entire education system, maybe it now extends even to preschool, I don't know, but certainly from primary school onwards, there is essentially a snobbery. I mean, what are people buying when they send their kids for vast sums of money to the private schools? They're not buying, we know this actually, now we have data, they're not always necessarily buying better teaching, but they are buying future networks of influence and social cachet. And my great fear is that this is now happening within the universities and that the same sorts of dilemmas that Carmen and Richard have pointed to in the school system is being duplicated in the tertiary system, most obviously and most clearly, as I say now in Victoria, with what's going on in the tapes. But I think by extension, and, and I have real forebodings of what a Liberal government would do, given the quite frequent statements by their spokespeople, about the need to have elite universities, um, I think there are real implications for us as a university community. And so where I'd like to end up is to suggest that if we actually think of education holistically, if we recognise that we are talking about the best system for our society, which will run from the first day kids go to school right through to their doctoral work at university, there is this underlying and huge and important debate to be had, which is at what point are the interests of the society as a whole concerned for maximising opportunities for everyone from which the society as a whole benefits. At what point and how do we balance that against the aspirational individualistic needs of particular families who for some reason have been persuaded by the current rhetoric that it's fine to spend 20000 of your own money, maybe it's up to thirty now, I'm not sure some of the fees, uh, to send your kid to a school because it's got cachet, snob value and you'll get a better job in the future, but any suggestion that we might increase taxation to improve overall the quality of our education standard is equivalent to highway robbery and, as we know, another great big tax. Well, I think there have been many issues raised by all three of our speakers about which we no doubt feel extremely passionate one way or the other. 
um, and we'll give you a chance to, uh, to ask some questions of these uh, three um, very important speakers on this topic. Um, I'm, I'm noting here that in the education review as, as uh, recently as yesterday there was a call for action from one of your colleague um, panel members, um, Ken Boston, Carmen, and uh, his call for action is on behalf of uh, the private schools um, who he believes, unless we see some government action very soon, uh, we risk losing their faith, the, the faith of the, of the uh, private schooling sector. Um, maybe you might like to comment on, on whether this is uh, something that you believe the Gonski report has tried to sort of take head on. Look, I, um, obviously a report like that, any committee uh, produces a result that is a, a compromise between the values and views of all of the members. But it has to be said that we were trying first and foremost to be realistic about what was capable of being achieved. And I share many of Dennis's values mm. about you know, an ideal system, a single funding source, etc., you know, a single system maybe with some varieties for different philosophies, and etc., but basically a system that doesn't have the divisions that ours has. We were realistic. We talked about it at length, but we realistically concluded that that wasn't likely. We could see no political environment in which it would be possible to go back and start from first principles. So, you know, given that, we tried to find a way of engaging all of the parties. So we talked to a lot of people, we visited schools, we had submissions, we commissioned research. It was all very public. It was out on the website. Our deliberations were very open and I think well informed. It's one of the best uh, committees that I've ever been part of and credit to David Gonski, he chaired it extremely well. We were well served by the, uh, the executive that, uh, uh, and staff who supported us. Um, but in the end, we recognised that it had to be, um, as I put it, politician proof. You know, that it really shouldn't, it shouldn't depend on who was in government at the time and that wasn't just an assessment of the likely fate of the Labor government at the next election. It was actually a sense of, you know, if, if we make our case properly, the independent schools, the Catholic schools, the government system will see that this is a, a reasonable outcome which has national objectives, you know, as, as uh, preeminent, but also the improvement of individuals' life chances and expansive capacity. So there are a lot of kids in independent and Catholic schools who will suffer if the status quo reigns okay. Uh, because there are a lot of schools who are missing out for the very reasons that we identified, um, both government and, and some of the independent and Catholic schools. So a failure to align all the forces, get them all behind us, and that's, I think, evaporating over time, will eventually mean that the Gonski uh, report will disappear like many others, unfortunately. So I'm with Ken on this. I mean, I think... I was disappointed the government didn't on day one say, this is what we're going to do, uh, step it out over five, ten years, you know, even if they didn't want to bite the five billion we recommended would be necessary, uh, at least to sort of see it as a project worthy of addressing. It was their brief and I think we delivered a, a, a feasible, um, reasonably pragmatic framework that would, in the same way as it's taken time for the disadvantaged to grow and emerge, it would also take time for it to be reduced. You know, it wasn't a one-off instant solution. But the longer we wait, I think the more the forces of reaction will <laughs> muster and, and you know, ignore what was in the report and position themselves on their usual uh, arguments. Mm. Julie underscores mm. some of the comments about whether we really are committed to equality mm. that, uh, mm -hmm. that Dennis made. Mm -hmm. I'm going to allow the audience to uh, ask questions because I know there are many people here uh, representing not just uh, the university sector, but the schooling sector as well. My question really is to Carmen, and I hope it's not regarded as unfair, but just if you could give your response and explanation to how the um, present government has um, taken Gonski. Um, are you disappointed? Were you, are you surprised? It's, and, but if I could say this, that the kinds of things that I mentioned in the introduction, mental health, disability insurance, now education, uh, all require money. And, and I'd like to put the framework of the, the, what it seems to me the failure of the government to respond to Gonski in, the, in terms of the way in which if, a, if an egalitarianism or a social democratic agenda is to return to this country in a serious way, 
I can't see how it can be done without an acceptance of the idea that there needs, and Dennis mentioned this, to be higher levels of tax. We're one of the lowest taxing countries in the OECD. But I, I can't, it seems to me anyhow that the, the response to these obvious areas of reform um, requires a very big shift in the rhetoric concerning taxation. We saw in the mining tax what went wrong. But if that's a prelude to asking for both your response to how the Gillard government has uh, uh, responded to Gonski and, and whether you're surprised by the, the failure to take the issue up and the explanation for that. I think it's worth uh, noting that the, the review took place over a year and a half too, so things were changing under our feet as we were conducting it, including, I think, uh, the, the failure of the debate on the mining tax in particular to be resolved in a way that would have seen substantial revenue. As a Western Australian, I'm one of these people who's absolutely in favour of the mining tax. I think it's dumb luck that we happen to have the minerals under our feet rather than you know, in Tasmania or somewhere else. And our federation's always been based on the idea of distributing resources in order to achieve an outcome that's similar for all citizens no matter where they reside. And for a long time, West Australians were beneficiaries and then subsequently we become donors and that becomes a problem for some people. But I think the government got that wrong too because the majority of Australians were in favour of the mining tax. Uh, they would have supported it in its original form. It would have provided uh, significant resources for long-term investments, including in education. I'm in favour of the you know, sovereign wealth fund, for example. Um, you're right, we are low taxed by uh, OECD standards. And that's one of the reasons we've had growing inequality, both because you know, people at the top end have been relieved of some of their tax responsibilities and people at the bottom end have had fewer sort of non-cash benefits from things like education and so on. So there's a whole context, I guess, in which the government um, failed to respond. But the principal problem in some way, ways was that the brief they gave us was that no school should lose a dollar. So the only way we could start to overcome some of the disadvantages that we described was to recommend additional funding. But we did try to present it in a way that would have enabled that to be stepped up, as I said earlier. And frankly, I was disappointed that the government then, when uh, the report came down, said, we'll have another round of consultation. We'd done that for them. We'd gone out there and we talked to everybody and as I say, the initial response surprised me a little. It was so positive, including from some of the people I would have suspected might be a little negative because they couldn't say they were going to lose anything because they weren't. They couldn't deny the inequality because it was obvious. They couldn't deny the problem because it was well laid out. And the best they could hope for was that with the affliction of time it would all go away. And sadly, I think that the government's played that hand straight to them and now we're seeing a lot of people backtracking. So I'm, I am disappointed that they didn't at least commit to the framework. Uh, I don't know what their reservations were because we kept them informed all the way along the way and they appeared to have no reservations about it. I'm mystified. And there is a lot of attention in the press about this inaction, um, but we're still not seeing action. My name is Jill Topsfield, I'm the uh, Education Editor at The Age and I just wanted to uh, reassure first of all Professor Altman that we uh, do care passionately about the impact of Bailey's broken promises uh, at The Age and we're certainly trying to do our level best to highlight the uh, <laughs> cuts to TAFE, the cuts to VCAL, the broken promise in terms of Victorian teachers being uh, the best paid in the nation. So I promise you that we'll uh, keep uh, badgering away at it. Um, but in the meantime, I was hoping to ask Professor Lawrence if she could expand a bit more on why she opposes a national curriculum. Look, opposition is probably too strong a word, but it's an area where I think uh, the so-called competition between the states uh, is at, are likely to produce interesting results. I don't see any real benefit with having a national curriculum that's just devised by a bunch of people, even if it's only a loose framework. Um, who aren't necessarily the ones engaged in teaching those programs in schools. And as I say, the evidence suggests, and this is OECD evidence, that those systems that allow greater autonomy for teachers to devise, as I say, curriculum and pedagogy within, and techniques of pedagogy within a reasonable set of objectives that are agreed, are the ones that appear to produce better outcomes. When you think about it, it means you're, you're respecting the professionalism of the teachers. By the way, it goes hand in hand with very well-trained teachers, you know, master's degree, high levels of competition of entry into teaching. So there are other things that go with it. But I think as a professional, as a university lecturer, for instance, I wouldn't want someone telling me exactly what I should teach and how to teach it. 
and I don't think classroom teachers are any different. As, as long as they reach certain outcomes, they understand their community and the people around them better than any curriculum authority at a national level could do. And one of the consequences of this is that a lot of money is being spent achieving uniformity, when I think uniformity is often achieved by exchange of ideas anyway. You know, you see educational fashions swing through the system. You don't need someone telling you at a national level how to do it. So, and there's great expense too in lining up um, schools. So in Western Australia, in the last budget, half a billion dollars were allocated to taking Year 7 students from primary into secondary schools. I thought, half a billion dollars. Imagine what you could do with that to reduce the, some of the gaps that we've been talking about. So I think often that desire for uniformity drives expenditure that is, frankly, uh, likely to be wasted and not going to achieve much of an outcome. But, but in any case, it's also illusory. Yeah. Um, the, it, we can test that by looking at what universities do. Mm. Australian universities recognise senior certificates from right across, mm. uh, across the country. They don't need an Australian curriculum, let alone a new baccalaureate, mm. which is in the budget papers. Mm. I mean, th they communicate with each other. We, we, we enrol, we send, we've, we've sent a bus to Queensland to collect talented students at our university. Mm. So we don't have any problems with the Queensland Senior Certificate no. and, and none with WA. So why do we need a national curriculum to do that? There was a question over here, please. Um, you talked about concentration of disadvantage and the report recognises that. Um, and coming from a rural school and which would be considered low socioeconomic, um, in my experience that produces a culture of low aspirations, low teacher morale and a cycle of problems. Um, my question is, do you think funding's enough and if so, how do you envisage the funding to actually break that culture? Richard, do you want to start um, and then come? Uh, the, the funding has to be there. We, we would spend in this state about 50 million, no, no, we'd spend twice as much on rural adjustment to ensure that our country schools are viable. Uh, so you have, the funding has to be there, that's the first thing. It definitely has to be there. It's very expensive to run small country schools but it's extremely important to run them. The question is how well the dollars spent. And Lorraine mentioned uh, some points before and the, the biggest and the most important one is to expose one school to another school, to expose one teacher to another teacher, one student to another student. It's the exposure that, that is the source of rising standards and expectations. So it's not enough just to deliver a package of money. It's really important to get a process going in which there's exchange of teachers, in which there's interaction between students. It's another reason why segregation isn't good because it doesn't support high standards. So yeah, money's not enough. I agree with that. It's what you do with it that's really critical. But we have a broad idea of what we should, we should be doing with it. I think you, you put your finger on something very important and, and that is expectations. That in communities that have a history of educational disadvantage for whatever reason, whether it's remoteness or a lot of Aboriginal kids or people from relatively poor backgrounds, the expectations start to be set very low and the culture develops and I've seen this happen in schools where nobody thinks the kids are going to finish school, they don't do the hard subjects. My sister's a principal in an outer metropolitan uh, school in Perth. There are a lot of educators in my family and I get into trouble if I'm not, kept, uh, not keeping up to speed. But she, but she says that she has teachers in the school, and this is not a reflection on the profession, who have been there so long, their expectations of the students are so poor that she can't convince them sometimes to let the really bright kids who are obviously capable of doing more demanding subjects actually sit the exams. So I think you can get that. We know in psychology the so-called Rosenthal effect that just by labelling someone and, and delivering a, a lecture in a certain way or, or, a, or a classroom uh, lesson, you can diminish the performance of your students. So I think we need to talk about those things more too and teachers in, in education obviously need to be very aware of that risk. Well, we are going to have to, uh, we'll have one final question from Maria and then a quick one and we'll have to complete. My comment was actually going to be following on from a comment about, I'm a principal in a secondary school in the north, so it was interesting to hear what you said, Carmen, about aspirations and expectations and that has been my experience very much in a low SES school and I don't think Richard's research was meant to um, create this, but there is a myth 
now and it's very hard to dispel this myth with teachers. That's a lot of my battle. Why bother when they're coming? The postcode is the determinant of the student's success and that is what I'm working really hard to change because it's very much, and I am um, changing the curriculum to give them, I suppose, subjects that will um, challenge the kids cognitively, but I feel a little bit disheartened, Richard, when you say these kids from low SES schools aren't going to achieve compared to the other. You know, if we're offering the subjects that are going to challenge them, they're still going to perform lower than the students from the public school. So what, what do we do then when we work against, uh, dispel, we're trying to dispel those myths, we are doing the, the high expectations, we're really focusing on the one thing that matters and that is good quality teaching because that is what makes the difference and on precise teaching when what we're getting in the media is postcode matters and low SES schools don't, Thanks, don't make a difference. Um, a very quick response, Richard, because uh, we are just about out of time. Uh, uh, well, the postcode is not to quote a famous person who's our Prime Minister, a sentence of death. And what I'm, when, when I draw attention to the, the power of social forces to affect average, average outcomes, I'm not trying to disempower teachers or suggest that it's worthless. I wouldn't be in the business if, if I thought my, my research was discouraging what good teachers and good principals do. It's not that at all. In fact, the research on postcode shows just how important it is to have good leadership in schools and good teaching in classrooms. It actually emphasises the importance because every child matters in that context. And so even if you're not going to produce a revolution in outcomes, the, the, the impact you can have for each and every individual child is of great importance. So actually my research emphasises the, the extreme importance. A rich private school can trade along. A poor public school in the northern suburbs of Melbourne can't trade. It must be innovative, creative, energetic. So it, don't feel discouraged at all. It just means the task is more acute and your capacity, the, the, your powers, you, you need more of them. But it's not diminishing you in any way or intended to frustrate you. So on that, on that positive note, we'll, we'll conclude our discussion. Would you join me, please, in thanking very warmly uh, Carmen, Richard and Dennis.